also been seeing that, that we've got the slaughter plants, the big slaughter plants down in the states really fixed up. And I'm not going to call them harvest facilities because that's absolutely totally ridiculous. I mean, harvesting something you do for grain. And sometimes ag wants to cover up what we do when we ought to be just showing everybody what we do. So get a plant really fixed up. So the handling is really, really good. The plant's working great. And then you bring me in animals I can't handle. Half dead dairy cows, that's something that just needs to get flat cleaned up. But then another problem is what I call biological system overload. Um, I'm seeing pigs coming in that have been so loaded up on beta agonists that they can't walk off the truck and go through the stockyards and walk up the chute. They're just too weak. Or you've got pigs where nobody has uh, gone into the pens with the pigs to get them used to people being in the pens, and they're crazy to handle. Or they've got arthritis joints this big where they're going to have difficulty walking. You've got to give me an animal that I can handle. And the problems that I'm seeing now, we're going to have to push back down to the supply chain to the producer. Because you get a plant fixed, then I start seeing where I'm getting animals I just can't handle. And putting conveyors all over the floor to handle them, no, that's ridiculous. Made that mistake back in the 80s trying to handle bob calves. Well, if they can't walk, then they've got no business being transported and go into a slaughter plant and they can't walk. Got to give me something I can handle. And just as we're getting the handling better, and we're really cleaning up our act on neglect, abuse, transport, stupid transport, awful things and things like that, I'm now starting to see problems with the animals getting more problems. I'm seeing feedlot cattle coming into the plants where they're lame from too much uh, beta agonists and some of them are heat stressed from too much beta agonists. Well, that's like difficult cattle to handle. It's also a really, really, really big welfare issue. So just as we are cleaning up the abuse and neglect, cruelty things, I'm seeing some of these other problems. Now, broiler chickens, they've had problems with being lame from growing really fast. The broiler industry actually is cleaning up some of those problems. So as they're fixing it, I'm seeing these problems now in beef and pork, and I'm not happy about it. And I have, uh, this summer, I watched at the truck unloading dock, and I was getting madder and madder and madder as I saw cattle coming off, fat feedlot cattle coming off, their tongues hanging out, sore-footed light. And the thing that's really weird about some of this beta agonist stuff is it doesn't affect all the animals evenly. You've got 100 head of cattle. You'll have five or six that can barely walk, tongues hanging out. You'll have maybe 20% that are sore-footed, normal-looking feet, they act like they're walking on hot metal, and the rest of the cattle are okay. It doesn't seem to affect them evenly, and I don't know why. That's just something that I've observed, and I've observed it a number of times in a number of plants. All right, let's get back to my favorite subject, handling. And it's really good. Let's talk about some of the good things. People are really starting to take low-stress handling more seriously. There's lots of people out there doing workshops. When I first started out working on cattle handling, Back in the 70s, people thought I was nuts. The first thing people have got to do is they've got to calm down. Don't be yelling and screaming. Joe Stuckey here in Canada found that yelling and screaming raised the heart rate more than the sound of gates slamming. you got to calm down. A calm animal is easier to handle. It's just that simple. And in doing my classes for veterinary students, animal science students, I want to get people to read signs that the animal's getting excited or the animal's calm. You've got nice soft brown eyes, you've got calm cattle. They start popping out, you see the whites of the eyes of cattle and horses, then you're getting upset, scared animals. And there's some very nice scientific studies on this. And one of them was done by Tina Wadowski and her group up at the University of Guelph. You've got the ears forward, he's just alert, he's calm. Okay, in horses and cattle, the tail's swishing, they're upset. Eye white, heads up, ears pinned back. Well, one of the things we're having to do with students today, we've got a lot of students coming out of the city, we've got to just train uh, the students today on these things they don't know instinctually. You know, I've got a lot of, I've had students in my livestock handling class where they've never even, you know, hardly seen cattle before. Well, touch cattle, they get to touch cattle for the first time in my lab. And for someone who's never done that before, that's a big deal. We've got to get people learning about these things. One of the things I preach, all kinds of stuff, animal handling, animal behavior, is I want people to use behavior rather than force. 
This is sometimes a difficult concept to get across. Okay, you've got a little chain hanging down in the chute. I've talked about this a zillion times before. The cattle don't want to go through the chute. Why after 35 years do I still have to talk about this? Because people don't remove them. They don't remove them. And I'm now beginning to see that maybe they're just not seeing them. You know, there's different ways that people think. I don't think they're seeing them. You know, like I read about that atomic uh, reactor accident over in Japan with the uh, earthquake. Okay, the earthquake gets there. Well, emergency generators turn on that run the coolant pumps. And then the tsunami comes and drowns the pumps and the generators that are in the basement. And I'm going, well, if you live next to the sea, maybe putting those generators in the basement wasn't a very good idea. And I don't know anything about designing the reactor part, but I know big diesels don't work underwater. That I do know. And I'm beginning to think, maybe they're not seeing it. And I have found in people working with animals, some people kind of have the instinct on how to work with them, and some don't. And I've been doing a lot of work on auditing, and about 20% of people are naturally great stock people. Then I can train a big bunch of people in between, and then there's a bottom 10% that's just terrible. And what I've been observing on just animal husbandry practices and all kinds of farming, the people that are getting better, that's improved. You know, the segment that's good, that has improved, and it's improved a whole lot. But there's a bottom 10%, really atrocious operations, and they're still there. That hasn't changed. Well, I teach my students to look for things where there's a change in flooring. Animals notice visual details that we don't notice because they live in a sensory-based world. You've got to get away from language if you want to understand animal behavior. It's a world of pictures, a world of sound, a world of smells. Well, you're heading right into the sun, it's going to make cattle handling really difficult. You can get time of day effects. I find I have to give people checklists on all these different distractions. And oftentimes people want to rip up the facility where maybe all that's wrong is change the time of day that you're working on. Or maybe put up a solid side so they don't see the cars going by or the people walking by. Sometimes it's something really simple, like this reflection. Well, another two hours later, you won't have that reflection. Well, my very first work, I got down in the shoes to see what cattle were singing. And on a sunny day, you've got all these stripes. And one of my early jobs that I went to, I noticed my own shadow was cast on the entrance to the chute. And that made the animals not want to go in. They can see people up there. Well, if they've got people in the way up there, I've got to cover up the side. Or I've got to get the people completely out of the way. But I want people thinking about what are they seeing? Look at how those animals there are avoiding walking on the sunbeam. You know, on a sunny day you've got shadows like that, and on a cloudy day you don't have them. And that's what I call the black hole. And we've got a cattle handling facility in a building, and on a sunny day they won't go in there. Now at night, I can light it up with electric lights. I can get them in there. You can't get your horse in the trailer? Why don't you try it at night? Light up the trailer at night with an electric light. But that doesn't work in the daytime because the sun's a zillion times brighter than an electric, li electric light. What I gotta do is rip off tin and I got to get natural daylight in there. Because they have a tendency to move towards the light. But they're not gonna go into blinding sun, like driving down the freeway. Or you take some tin off and put in white translucent panels so they can see light in there. Then they're gonna go in. You'll also notice right here, a solid crowd gate. Well, there's one gate that needs to be solid, and that's the crowd gate, so they don't turn back on you. Okay, this is a picture that I showed to my students. And people always wonder, do they know they're gonna get slaughtered? Oh, we gotta answer that question. And I found that they act the same way at the slaughterhouse as they act in the, you know, in the farm veterinary shoot. They knew they were going to get slaughtered, they'd be a lot wild, they should be much, much, much wilder at the slaughterhouse. And I've taken people on a lot of tours of large slaughter plants, and I always have them stand here and watch the cattle go up the chute so they can see that they're going up there calmly. And the reaction is, it's not as bad as I thought it was going to be. We need to be showing stuff. So I show this slide to my students and I say, what are the distractions we might need to remove from this picture? And they'll talk about, oh, well, we've got a little chain right here. Yes, there's a little chain right there. That could be a problem. But you know what they fail to see? How about the three guys standing here in the wrong place? 
over half the students don't see the three guys. Sometimes the most obvious is the least obvious. It's just like putting generators in the basement. You know, it's like so obvious. How could you do that? Four nuclear power plants burned up, at least two of them with total loss of containment. I mean, you're talking about a complete mess because you don't you think generators can work when they're underwater? I don't know about that. Okay, this just shows some of my facilities. As I said earlier, when I was young, in the 70s, I thought I could fix everything with equipment. I thought if I could just build the right system, everything will work right. And I found I could only fix half of the problems with equipment. Then in the 80s, I started working on training employees. Well, then managers untrained. Then I went to training managers. Because you want to have good animal treatment, you got to get management to buy in. And then in the late 90s, that was the McDonald's era. I worked on implementing the McDonald's Animal Welfare Auditing Program. And I saw more change than I'd ever seen before. Well, now they had to do it. Or the plant's going to get kicked off the approved supplier list. So I spend most of my consulting time now working with retailers and restaurant companies. And then we've got to have things that are practical. And I developed a very simple, practical uh, animal welfare scoring system. Because another reality I have is I got a day and a half workshop to train them in. And then maybe go to five places with an experienced person. But that's the reality. And if it isn't simple, I can't train them. And I'm not going to go into all kinds of stuff on design right now. That's a whole nother talk. I do have a book, Humane Livestock Handling. It's got all my designs on it. And one other thing I will talk about in design is very briefly, when you lay out a round crowd pen, you must go around the full half circle. Because you want to take advantage of that natural tendency to go back to where they come from. When he's right there, he's got to see up their two body lines. Don't bend too sharp here. But make that a full half circle. You want to use that natural following behavior. Uh, you want to you know, use that natural behavior to go back to where they came from. Also, you've got to have enough lead-up shoot space so that you can bring them in there and they've got, you know, the, they can follow the leader into the lead-up shoot. People need to understand flight zone principles. And, oh, Susan Church had a fantastic slide, the cattle circling around people. I've got to get that slide from Susan Church. That's a great slide. But handlers need to understand basic animal handling principles. And, and there's a lot of people that just make, you know, you know, common mistakes like stand at the head of the cattle and poke the butt and try to get them to go forward. That just doesn't work very well. Well, that's just a handy dandy little movement uh, pattern to get them into the squeeze chute without having to use the electric prod. So what's my opinion of electric prods? Get them out of your hand. You shouldn't be carrying them around. I wouldn't recommend banning them. I've seen too many tails busted off and other, you know, bad things. But it's not your primary driving tool. And these are just very simple things to, to make it easier to handle. Like if this is the tailgate of the squeeze chute, I just step forward, walk back by. It's quickly like that. When I walk back past the shoulder, the animal's going to go forward. I mean, we've got to teach people basic principles, like you know the point of balance, uh, flight zone principles, just these really basic things. First of all, you've got to calm down. And if you're trying to get them up the chute, don't stand at their head and poke their butt. We still have lots and lots of people doing that. Right there, I'm using a flag to turn an animal. People get way too crazy with driving aids, flapping everything all around. You're talking little tiny movements like this. You know, when you get, really get into the low stress handling stuff, you can really do great things. Now, those things are going to take time to learn. You know, I can train people to calm down, do some very basic things. And then to get into some of the more advanced low stress handling methods, it's going to take time to learn. It's not something you're going to learn overnight. But if I don't get you calmed down and get you to stop screaming, you're not going to be able to learn any of the other things. Fill your crowd pen half full. I have been preaching this for 35 years. People still jam the crowd pen all the way up. Good handling takes more walking. Same thing loading pigs. You're loading pigs onto a truck. I want five or six brought up at a time. Good handling requires more walking. Now, 
the Cardinal Corporation and JBS Swift, two of our biggest beef plants, have put in video auditing where auditors over the internet can now watch the handling. Outside auditors over the internet. It is working really, really good. But one of the things that we learned is there were certain people that shouldn't be handling livestock and they had to be removed. It was about 10% of the people working with livestock. And when I worked on the original McDonald's audits, we had we have um, 75 beef and pork plants on the approved supplier list. Three plant managers had to be removed because nothing was going to change until they were gone. And the other good news, we were using an outcome-based system, is that out of 75 plants, only three had to do expensive new stuff. All the other plants I fixed with simple things, non-slip flooring. I just went through the dairy guideline. One of the things you really need in that dairy guideline about safe cattle handling facilities is non-slip flooring. If you don't have non-slip flooring, it's going to be a mess. Another thing is maintenance. You know, I agree with getting a lot of the design stuff out of there, but there's two things you've got to have. Non-slip flooring and you can't have a broken rack. You know, forklift pallets tied together with bailing string, that's just not, definitely not an adequate uh, cattle handling facility. And notice that it's filled half full. You also use it as a passing through pen. Wait until there's room in the chute and then bring them in. And then just keep on going and walk right up there. Well, I went out to one of the plants and I got the handling really, really good. And a year later, I had a chance to watch them over the remote video camera and there was 30 cattle jammed in the crap pen. I was not happy. You know, the good handling takes walking. And this is where management's gonna have to, you know, enforce it. Let's watch for posture things. You see how the zebra and the horse have an ear on each other? Animals put their ears towards things. I want students seeing that. One thing I really emphasize with my animal science students and my veterinary students, I want you to be observant. What do the eyes look like? What do the ears look like? Is it quivering? What's the animal doing? You know, look at these small postural changes. That tail is, is going back and forth on horses and cattle. That's your early warning before it bucks or before it kicks you. Okay, behavioral principles of restraint. I gotta have non-slip flooring. The fear of falling, it's a primal fear. Sudden jerky motion, both in equipment and in people, scares. And on the movie site, I had a chance to go out on the movie site, that was really, really cool, and they had this camera on a big, long boom. They call it a giraffe with a hot head with fluid motion control wheels. Well, if you're a camera geek, you really like this camera. But from a behavior standpoint, it's really cool because it just moved like this, and you could float it over the top of the cattle, and it was like it was not there. They didn't react to it. Another mistake that people make is they squish an animal too tight. And then there's other places where I need to block the vision. Most of these plants, it was amazing what I could do with big pieces of cardboard and a portable light. Oh, put a light on a chute to light it up, uh, cover up seeing people walking by with cardboard, and then I had to get the handlers to calm down and move smaller groups. Now, animals that become really agitated in the squeeze chute get really agitated during handling are going to have lower productivity. Good stockmanship pays. I mean, Dave Fraser showed the Paul Hemsworth research that showed that good stockmanship pays. We've known this for years, but I have found that often people want the thing, the new milking parlor, the new whatever, the new computer, the new drug. They'll buy the thing more than doing the management. And the older I'm getting, the more I'm getting into the management. And if I had a choice, what would I rather have? state-of-the-art facilities with poor management, or maybe older but adequate facilities with excellent management. I'll take the older but adequate facility with the excellent management, but it has to at least be an adequate facility. This is just, I use this slide to show people that rough handling really gets the stress levels up. You know, you're forcing cattle through handling facilities, you get a lot more cortisol. And a basic principle is, when animals move voluntarily through a facility, you don't get all the fear stress. Dairy cows are really low because they voluntarily go through the facility. You force them, then they're gonna get scared. They're gonna get fear. And some people say, well, that's being anthropomorphic, talking about fear in animals. Well, there's a ton of neuroscience research 
that shows that animals have fear. But the problem is, it's all over in the neuroscience literature. And ag people aren't reading it. An animal's first experience with something new needs to be good. This is one of the reasons why in many of the low stress handling workshops, they're emphasizing taking your young heifers, have a walk through the cattle handling facility. Have your heifers, your dairy cow heifers, walking through the milking parlor before you milk them, making sure that these are good first experiences, carefully acclimating animals to new experiences. I don't know how many times people have said to me, my horse or my lamb or my whatever was calm at home and it went absolutely berserk at the show. Well, there's lots of new things there, flags, bikes, and balloons. You better get them used to that before they come to the show and do it just carefully. Look at how those animals are approaching that clipboard. And then when the wind blows the paper, they run away. You see, curiosity, seeking new things. Animals, when they can voluntarily approach, novelty's attractive. You ram it in their face, then it gets scary. And the brain can switch back switch back and forth from fear or get attracted to novelty. Those circuits in the brain have actually been fully mapped out. And that's the kind of thing in the brain called the nucleus accumbens, and they can either go in fear mode or seek mode. Well, we want to have animals in seeking mode, not in fear mode. And if you have really calm uh, genetics, something sudden like an umbrella opening, you know, that would scare an animal. And there's genetic differences. And some animals get mo much more scared and react a lot more to a sudden stimulus than others. Men on a horse, men on the ground. Cattle view that as two different things. Some of the most dangerous cattle I have ever handled in a slaughter plant were cattle that had only been worked on a horse. And then they get their first man on a foot at a plant, and their flight zone's gone from two feet to 50 feet. And that gets super dangerous really fast in a small pen. And cattle that can be pets when you're working them on a horse get really dangerous, be running back and forth in the pens because no matter where the person in the plant goes, they're inside the flight zone. And the cattle are trying to get away. Another kind of animal that's really dangerous to handle at a plant is ones where dogs have bitten them in the single file chute. They're in a single file chute, they can't get away, dogs are biting them. Guess what they do in the plant? They kick with both back feet. I have nearly been killed by those kind of cattle. And in both cases, they came out of a feed yard. See, animal thinking is very specific. Man on a horse, man on the ground. It's two different things. You need to get the animal accustomed to both. Pigs, where a person has never walked through the pens, they're horrible to handle at the plant. They don't make the safety problem that cattle have, but they'll pile up and squeal and be impossible to handle. And then you get some arthritic joints on top of that, then they're totally impossible to handle and have good welfare. I gotta have an animal that's not crazy uh, uh, or totally scared and an animal that's not lame or heat stressed or weak. No, nope, those things are not good. All right, let's talk about designing auditing systems. We've got to have clear things. Another thing is an auditing program that we use for animal welfare commercially. It has to be simpler than something that we do for research. It has to be very clear. And the thing is, you manage stuff that you measure. We need to be measuring things like lameness with numbers. And then we can tell, are we getting better or are we getting worse? Beef cattle in the feed yards with beta agonists, we're getting worse on lameness. I'm seeing problems now I never used to see before on beef. Just as I got the plants fixed, I'm seeing cattle coming in with their mouths open and, and sore footed and when they, when they go, they're in the truck and they're like coming down the ramp on the truck like this, you know, because their feet hurt. No, that's not okay. Okay, I want to ban these words like proper, adequate, and sufficient. And the dairy guideline is a good guideline, but I did find a few of these words. What is sufficient space at the feeder? I'd rather write something like all the cows need to be able to eat at the same time. I'd rather write a guideline like that. I'm not telling you what the space is, but they've got to eat at the same time. I did a guideline like that for, for laying hens on, in conventional battery cages. They've got to all be able to line up like little feedlot cattle and eat all at the same time. That's very, very easy to audit. You know, because I've trained a lot of auditors, and if things aren't clear, it gets interpreted differently by different people. Like right now down in the States, we've got a big controversy on some of our humane slaughter directives. There's a directive in there about excessive electric projects. 
What is successive electric produce? What is minimize excitement, agitation, and cattle? That is not clear. Here's something that's clear on space. All the pigs have to have enough space to lie down without being on top of each other. And I better say, lie down at the same time without being on top of each other because you've got people that try to game the system. Oh boy, do I get sick of that. <laughs> All right, here's things we're scoring handling. How many animals fall down? We're doing that right now in the, in the meat plants. And if more than 1% fall down, you've just failed the McDonald's on it. There are certain critical control points where you ought to just fail. If more than 3% of the cattle moo and vocalize during handling, you fail the audit. And you've got to get 75% through with no electric prod. In other words, they have to make certain numbers. How did I determine what these numbers were? Collect the baseline data. And we put them where the top 25% of the plants would pass. See, there's a tendency on setting numerical standards to make them too low. Because unfortunately, some of the poorer producers get on these committees. A better approach is set it at the top 25% and give people time to work up. You know, really good dairies, lameness is 5%. But there's refereed journal articles that show that lameness can be, you know, like 25, 20, 25%. In both Europe, in both England and the US, that's horrible. Now this is the um, scoring system that we've been using now for about 12 years in the large um, meat plants. How many animals did you stun on the first attempt? It has to be 95% on the first shot. That's for captive bull. And for electric stunning, 99% correct placement. Most of the plants are doing this now. And on a 100 head audit, you've got to get them all insensible. Electric prod, it's 5% for excellent. And it's 25% um, you know, minimum passing score. How many vocalize? And how many fall? Falling, if there's something wrong with the floor and handling facility, it will show up with falling. Now these scores are very simple. It's per animal. Did it fall, yes or no? Did it moo or squeal, yes or no? It's very, very simple. Because I found if I don't make it simple, I can't get inter-observer reliability. And the thing that's good about something that's simple is whether I audited it or you audited it, we're getting the same scores. And the thing is, you got to pick out what are the important things to measure. Let's take vocalization, for example. It can be caused by a broken stump. It can be caused by a slippery floor slipping around. It can be caused by slamming doors on animals. It can be caused by running cattle on top of other cattle. These are all things that would make them vocalize. I got a lot of animals bellering. When I'm handling them, something's wrong. Now, obviously, if I brand cattle, that's going to make them bellow. But in slaughter plant, we're not branding. So I got a bell right up there around the stunning area, I got trouble. Now I don't score vocalization out in the stockyard of the larynx, because bulls will yak back and forth each other. It's only in the stun box and going up the chute while you're actively moving them up the chute, because it's a handling score. Now in 1996, when we collected our baseline data, only 30% of the plants could pass on the stunning score. You know what the problem was? Broken equipment. They simply didn't maintain the stunning equipment. Broken stuff. Oh, now they've got special test stands to put them on. They've got you know, documented maintenance things. There's nothing like having a big customer come on and say, you've got to do this. But the thing that made it work is it was very, very clear. They had to make certain numbers. And the thing is, you've got to pick out the right critical control points because I can't measure everything. You've got to figure out what are the really important things to measure. The principle is you measure a small number of critical control points that will measure outcomes, their outcomes of a lot of bad things. I could have them falling down due to slippery floor. I could have them falling down due to just getting them too excited. Maybe they could fall down because there's something wrong with the animals. Well, there's something wrong with the animals that needs to be corrected. If animals can't walk off of trucks and walk through the plant, uh, uh, then that has to be fixed at the producer level. You know, some people have, want to water down the standards because of all the fatigued pigs we've got now. You know what, I'm sick of fatigued pigs. I want to get rid of them. There's a big plant I just recently went to this year that used to just have horrible problems with fatigued pigs. You know, where they had pigs that just were too weak to walk through the plant. You know what made it go away? 
They get a $25 fee to recover the costs of having downers on the truck. Guess what? They got rid of most of the downers. Producer doesn't want to pay a $25 um, fee to reimburse the plant and pay for the guy to drive the bobcat loader. And the thing is, this works just like food safety. The other thing is, it's based on directly observable things. It's not a paperwork audit. I'm sick and tired of paperwork audits. Well, I've seen more fake records than you can shake a stick at. And when the video auditing started, uh, they have just 23 plants on that system now. About three or four plants are caught in fake records. And it took a while for the video audits to match the audits taken by the internal quality assurance people. Because they'd see the clipboard there and they'd um, you know, act good. And the thing that was interesting was study the score didn't change. That was so dependent on the maintenance of the equipment. That's a very equipment dependent thing. But handling, that's the thing that went bad when the back was turned. And there were some people that had to be removed. And uh, now it's, they're kind of, they did put too many cattle in the crowd pen, but they still managed to make their numbers when they did it. But it's not a paperwork audit. And I'm very concerned about everything turning into a paperwork audit. That's not gonna do anybody any good. Okay, then you can use scoring to see how I changed something and I improved it. Like for example right here, air blowing in the faces. The plant's ventilation system blows air out in their faces, they're not gonna go in. So we should fix that. And we went from 4.5% of the animals vocalizing down to zero, because they didn't have to jam them with the electric prop. Or I put a light on the entrance of the pig chute. Oh, little duct tape and a little uh, light, portable light. And I went from 38% of those animals uh, balking and you know, having to be prodded down to 4% just by putting the light on the entrance. But the thing that drives me crazy is people break the light and they don't put it back on. And when the light breaks, instead of putting it back on, they start ripping up the facility and making a mess out of it. Okay, this is my center track restrainer system. And if you've seen the HBO movie, you're going to see that this ramp right here looks exactly like what was shown in the HBO movie. I've got a non-slip ramp. And in the movie, I had a non-slip ramp going into the dip vat. And a big piece of metal was put on that to make them slip. It's hard for people to get their head around using the non-slip ramp. Two plants this year messed around with the ramp. Either cut it off to jump them in, or they cut, took the cleats off to make it slippery. And one of the plants, it's like so stupid, I had a light up here, and it was working great, the light broke. Well, instead of fixing the light, they went and messed around with the ramp. This is a system that worked absolutely beautifully a year ago. I was in it a month ago, it was like, it was just running like crap. I, I, it, it was running, it was squeaking by through, it was just squeaking by the audits. But it, I'm beginning to think now that people just aren't seeing it, that 35 years later, they're making the same mistake that was shown in the movie. The visual cliff, I thought maybe I better just start explaining to you what the visual cliff is. Uh, animal, an babies and goats don't like to walk out over something that looks like a visual cliff. And in the system here, this whole thing, eight feet above the ground, or maybe you know, three meters above the ground, I gotta have a false floor in here so they don't look down and see the visual cliff effect. Well, then the false floor gets taken off of there because they don't want to clean it. They're taking pieces of metal off this thing that are on there strictly for a behavior reason. Well, I guess it's gonna give me job security because I gotta go back there and put it back on there again. <laughs> but I'm still thinking, what am I doing in the maintenance shop of this plant at 10 o'clock at night putting the stuff back on here years and years and years and years later? Okay. I put a light on the entrance, I went from 8% vocalizing down to zero. There's the false floor. The plan of taking the false floor off, so I replaced it with cardboard. That's obviously just temporary. But I went from 9% mooing down to 0%. And then another place they had a head gate that squished the neck, and I lowered the pressure. I went from 23% mooing their heads off down to zero. Now the vocalization is done per animal. It's either silent or he moves. So if he moves three times, that's still one animal. There's the light. Yep, I gotta keep showing that because people keep taking them off. <laughs> Ugh, just 
drive me crazy. Okay, and then I can also use scoring to pick out my really bad animals that are difficult to handle. Easy to drive versus hard to drive pigs. Prod score, 4% on good pigs, 20% on bad pigs. The amount of squealing that went on was like three times worse. You know, you can measure this stuff because we got to prevent bad from becoming normal. That's what we got to do. Now there's three types of variables, and I think it's really good now that people are going towards these animal-based, outcome-based measures. But you can't just use betting as sufficient as an outcome measure. I want to get something a little clearer than that. And then you have some practices you ban. For example, the dairy guideline is pretty much banning tail docking. And then there's still a few input-based measurements we need, ammonia levels. If they're living inside, we need to be measuring ammonia. That's a problem area in many situations. Okay, let's look at dairy, for example, and body condition score. Okay, I just read the body condition score directions in the new dairy guideline. Well, I've, done, I've trained hundreds of auditors, and they're going to read those directions and go, mm, 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 I don't know what that means. Well, I'm reading through it, and I'm thinking, what can I tell them? If you can count the ribs, she fails. If you can actually count the vertebrae, she fails. I actually use that method in on, on, on sows, on, on sows. And if you can actually see the individual bumps down her back, she's too skinny. Now there's another chart that we have that shows the butt end of the cow. I literally like that, those charts where you're looking at the butt end like this because those verbal descriptions, it's too hard to train people on that. So if I had to train, if I, if I was hired to train on your guideline, I would be really emphasizing if I can count ribs and I can count vertebrae bumps, she's in non-compliance. You see, and that's something that's very, very clear. We've got to have things that are clear. On lameness scoring, I like videos. Um, and then another way of wording it is, uh, you know, ones and twos I'm gonna, I, I are gonna be just classified as not lame. Three is an animal where it's obviously limping, but it keeps up with the walking herd. Fours cannot keep up with the walking herd, and fives, you know, they're just hobbling. But if it isn't very clear, you can't train people. How about dirty animals? Well, we need to have some cutoffs. You had cutoffs in there on body condition score and lameness. But how about dirty animals? Okay, how about minimizing hock lesions? Let's start counting hock lesions. My student, Wendy Fulmulbider, has got a paper in the Journal of Dairy Science. She went to 113 dairies. The top 20% had none of the severe swellings. So you've got to have a simple scoring system. Hair loss, you have normal, then you have hair loss. A lesion on the worst leg smaller than a baseball, or a lesion on the worst leg bigger than a baseball. That's very easy to train people on. Uh, coat condition and organic. Okay, you organic people, some of you think it's okay to have bald spots and lice on cattle, ringworm on calves. No, that's not okay. I'm going to do a code condition score. But we've got to collect data, put numbers on this stuff. Because there's also things, I think everything on this list is a critical control point. I mean, let's say everything was wonderful on, the, uh, on, on this dairy, but you had 35% lame cows, I think you need to fail a welfare audit. You know, the, I don't want to be getting enough scores on paperwork and things like that where I could have all these lame cows and you could pass an audit. Or if you had a whole bunch of cows full of lice, I mean, you need to be bailing an audit for that. Okay, now, lameness is an outcome measure. And one of the outcome things that can be one of the factors is how hard we're pushing animals. But there's other factors too. If it's feedlot cattle, or pigs, and it's ractopamine, that's caused by going crazy with a ractopamine or with a sulpanerol. Dairy cows don't get that stuff, so it's going to be other kinds of things. But lameness is a great outcome measure. Lots of different things make cows lame. So I can stand there at the exit of the milking parlor and uh, I can just kind of screen them. You see, something I measure for research is going to be more complicated than something I'm going to just measure out in the field. Okay, then we have some practices that we just ban. You know, that's simple enough. Now the public just is not gonna accept sow gestation stalls. Now like four different surveys, starting with my survey on United Airlines. Basically, two thirds of the public hates them. 
You know, they don't seem to have a problem with pigs being indoors, but not being able to turn around for most of their life. They don't like that. And there's a few input measures that we're going to need. That's my website, but before I end, I want to just talk about how we're going to need to communicate with the public a whole lot better. And it frustrates me that I've worked on cleaning up our slaughterhouses and nobody knows about it. Let's start putting videos up on YouTube. Two and a half years ago, I put up my pig stunning video. It's almost got a million views. And I get a lot of good comments on it. Also get some F-bombs on it. Those you've got to block and delete. But I don't block dissent. You know, somebody writes meets evil, I don't take that down. But it's got to be civil. We've got to get out and show what we do. And people are just so far removed from agriculture. There was a lady this summer at the Calgary Stampede, and she thought that piglets were puppies. I mean, the most basic things people don't know. I had a freshman call me last week, a Colorado State University freshman, and she was very interested in animal issues. And she was just reading off the activist websites. And she didn't have any library skills. She didn't know how to use Google Scholar or PubMed or Science Direct or any of the websites for getting into um, you know, more academic things. I, no, put up videos. You know, people just tend to talk to themselves. And I think the internet's making this worse because I just uh, read an article in the brand new um, Nature magazine about uh, analysis of Twitter posts. And what was done is they took all these Twitter posts, like several months of them, and they uh, analyzed it by keywords for stuff about Republicans and Democrats. You know, certain keywords, is all done automated. And guess what the network analysis showed? Republicans talk to Republicans, Democrats talk to Democrats. People have a tendency to not go outside their circle. And we've got to start doing that. Uh, we've got to start looking at things and say, well, if I brought my wedding guests out here from Toronto, what would they think? And if you're squirming now, we better change it. Well-run beef slaughter plant, that actually passes the test. And the Cargill Corporation invited the Oprah Winfrey Show to come into the plant in Fort Morgan, Colorado. They're to be absolutely commended for that. I was real uh, happy about that. You know, and I tell people about the McDonald's audits, and they go, oh, McDonald's did that? There's a lot of things good going on. But we've also got some things that we've got to clean up, too. And I'm a little dismayed about some of the problems I'm seeing in pigs and cattle right now. When we're doing things to them, making them hard to handle. High grain prices, that motivates people to do stuff they shouldn't be doing. Pushing the animal too hard. We've pushed a dairy cow to the point she only lasts for two lactations. I think we need to start thinking about what would be the optimal level of productivity. Quality and quantity, two opposing goals. You know, if we, I can remember the Kianina fad back in the 70s. Yeah, you got a ribeye this big of dried out tough meat. Okay, now we're doing it with beta agonists and you're getting bad meat quality. We're getting tough meat. It's very well documented in the literature. That doesn't make too much sense. Especially since these products, one of these products tends to make the cattle look like a bull. Well, why are we cutting the testicles off? You know. They come free with the bull, why are we cutting them off? Why are we spending all this money giving them all these feed additives uh, when uh, you got natural package comes with the bull and we take it off? Uh, just doesn't make very much sense to me. Well, what I'd like to do now is just uh, open it up for a bunch of questions and uh, thank everybody for coming. And I also got to put a plug in for my book, Improving Animal Welfare, a Practical Approach. And Improving Animal Welfare, a Practical Approach is aimed at people that have to implement auditing systems. You know, you're a veterinarian out on the farm, you're a retailer, how do we actually, you know, make auditing programs that are gonna work? Because I'm finding there's a lot of veterinarians that don't know why behavior is important. Tina Wadowski has a very nice chapter in there on how to measure behavior, and that you can actually measure it. I, people don't talk to each other, and while a lot of the research is done in ethology, the veterinarians aren't reading that. Well, I'm trying to like cross that divide.